So, dear colleagues, dear friends, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mirela Shuterici, and I'm the director of policy at IGVA. I will be moderating this uh, last session for today, which focuses on partnership. And I'm glad that many of you are back. I know it has been a long day, full of interesting discussions, but also a bit tiring. But the fact that many of you are back in the room shows us of the interest and the importance you give to this session, which is on a partnership. And throughout the day, we heard a lot about the current challenging humanitarian landscape and on how much we have a gap between rising needs and the funds available. We heard also a lot about the partnership and the importance of having the correct partnership in place. And the two go very well together because in order to manage to navigate the current challenges, we need to have adequate partnerships. We need to strengthen collaborative efforts. That's why also in 2007, the Global Humanitarian Platform and many other organizations, IGVA included, worked together on the principles of partnership. And since then, we have been promoting these principles of partnerships in relation to states, but also to UN agencies, in relations between each other, and also private sector. But how are we doing today? Are we managing to build fair and justice partnerships, or are partnerships further aggravating existing inequalities and power imbalances? What are the values driving our partnerships, and how are they translated into concrete contractual arrangements? What is our vision on partnerships, and how is that finally translated into concrete clauses of how much and under which conditions? These are some of the questions that this session will consider, and I have the privilege to have four excellent panelists to contribute to the discussion together with all of you. Allow me, please, to introduce the speakers. First, joining us online from Washington, D.C., Mr. Matthew Nims, Deputy Assistant Administrator of the Bureau of Humanitarian Affairs, USAID. Welcome. With us here in the room, Mr. Misikir Tilahun, Executive Director of African Humanitarian Action. Ms. Hazel Devat, Deputy Director of the Office of Emergency Programs at UNICEF, and Ms. Sarah Furman, Director of Humanitarian Policy at Interaction. Welcome to you all. I look forward to hear from each and every one of you. I have prepared a few questions for you to guide your intervention, and after your interventions, we'll open the floor for questions and discussions with all the participants. I would like first to give a floor to Mr. Matt Nims. Matt, thank you very much for joining. You are in a very important position, in a very influential state, which is also the largest humanitarian donor. So, of course, a lot of responsibilities on you and your office. And we have followed with uh, great satisfaction some recent uh, investments and work from your office. I refer to the guidelines on localization, but also to the more recent acquisition and assistance strategy, which also refers to partnership. My question to you is, what are the aims and values of your partnership engagement with NGOs? And also, what steps are you undertaking to implement them? Thank you, and the floor is yours. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks, especially, for making a, a venue where I could come in virtually. I would have much preferred being there in person, and, and I apologize for not making the, making the trip over, but hopefully the, 
that's something we can remedy uh, in the future. Um, as as uh, was said, I, my name is Matt Nims. I am the, we call it DAA here in USAID, uh, the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. I, I am glad, glad to be here, and I know that there's some other of my colleagues that from BHA that are in the room too, and I'm sure that they'll have much more detailed and, and uh, information as needed as we go forward. Um, I do want to say and pass along um, from the uh, assistant to the administrator, basically the, the, the leader of the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance, Sarah Charles. She wishes she could have been here either in person or on this, but she did get pulled away uh, for some other business. Um, but and she's sorry, you know, that she she couldn't be here and apologize for that conflict. But please know that um, she uh, she like all of us at BHA are glad about uh, this partnership and about um, uh, and about working um, together with all of you. Excuse me for my phone. Um, I, I'm excited um, to be here, and, and I'm so glad that ICFA is a, is is having these critical conversations. Um, you know, a lot of these conversations, I believe, especially in this, the, the partnership category, are, are, are the exact same questions that, that BHA is talking about, uh, the, are the Humanitarian Assistance Bureau, as well as the agency in general. And, and I think, um, you know, through the last, you know, since the grand bargain and before, I don't know if there's been that same level of attention um, on on partnership, but really on on pushing it towards newer bounds. I think we've always known, in in, in as a donor from from USAID perspective, that we are here. We're important only because of our work with our partners, and 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 that that these relationships are crucial to how, on the humanitarian side, but development in general, how we're able to have the impact that, that I think we need in, in these places. So I think fundamental to everything we do is partnership. But I do think we are at a, a bit of a pivotal point, a lot because of the, the, um, the administration currently um, uh, in, in Washington, and with this focus on localization. And I think that that's going to be a big topic uh, as we go forward in, in, in this discussion today. But we are at that point of, I think, beyond talking about it, um, and even beyond setting goals, but preparing the landscape for more of a cultural or mind shift of, of the people in, in, who, uh, on my side, who look at how we, we really look at how we respond, we as a donor, but really how we can respond better in different, more expansive partnerships with, with, with local partners. And I think that this is a very exciting time to be, um, to be watching all of this and, and to figure that out. Um, I think it's important that we, in this time, we USAID, we BHA, are able to participate in venues and, and discussions like this. Because as we go forward, it, it, just as you said, um, Miriala, it, it's important that we get beyond, you know, goal setting, but down to the tactical, how we're actually going to do this. And I think venues and discussions like this are going to be really important to be able to get the lessons and ideas and some of the you know frank impediments that exist from the donor perspective and from really from the from our partners perspective on, on what is hampering our, our ability to do this um, we're excited uh, on the BHA side uh, to be launching a new program with the ICFA secretariat uh, to hold a series of these convening meetings going forward and I think that that we're going to be getting more information from again, you know, partners at all levels on how we can push forward these agendas and recommendations for advancing our localization goals. I guess finally, um, I want to take the opportunity to thank Ignacio Park, uh, Packer um, for his illustrious service to ECFA. Um, the team w was really went out of their way to tell me how how phenomenal it has been to work with him and ICFA in general in many different venues. And I, I want to take the time to be able to recognize that and and uh, with our long-term kind of involvement with, with, with ICFA and, and with him in general and, and specifically. Um, we wish him the best in his next steps and we look forward to working with um, new ICFA um, leadership as we go forward. So with that, I'll conclude my remarks and uh, look forward to questions. Over. 
Thank you very much, Matt. And uh, Ignacio is here in the room, and I'm sure he's very pleased with your comments. Um, I can assure you that uh, ICVA would still insist to invite you and the assistant administrator to our next meeting, and next time hopefully in, pre in person, <laughs> and we will uh, encourage other opportunities for you to be in direct contact with our national and local members, because we look forward to, to support the initiatives taken by BAJ in terms of uh, localization. And we have many local and national NGOs here in the room, so during the Q&A session, I'm sure that they will have many concrete questions about the BAJ engagement on localization. Thank you, Matt. I have also here with me in the room, Missy Kier, who knows a lot about local and regional realities because uh, he's the executive director of a regional organization working on refugee protection throughout Africa. So Missy Kier, thank you first of all. And then the question to you is, what does equitable partnership means to you? What are some of the challenges you face in partnership? And what solution would you propose? The flow is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mirella. And I, it's the first time I'm taking the floor today, so I will take this opportunity also to thank ICVA for um, coming back to this in-person annual conference where we come together from various parts of the world to discuss these um, timely, challenging, difficult conversations. Um, as uh, it was said in the opening this morning, ICFA has never shied away from um, uh, at least addressing the issues uh, or creating the, the forum for this. So uh, I thank the Secretariat, the staff, the board for getting us back to this format uh, once again. Um, in terms of um, equitable partnerships, um, I recall a conversation that we had yesterday during the members' um, uh, meeting, members' uh, members' day, when we talked about DEI and diversity, equity, and inclusion within our own organizations. And this notion was uh, expressed that um, equity does not necessarily mean equality. Um, equity refers to uh, achieving fairness within a certain eco ecosystem. Uh, equality ha refers more to sameness. Um, so when we talk about equitable partnership for us, um, and, and I suspect is the, sa the case for many other organizations in, in the same scenario, um, our push for equitable partnership is, has never been to, uh, about achieving equality with our international and global partners. Um, we never started out on equal footing from the beginning. Um, the history of how we come about to humanitarian action is very much marred by unequal circumstances, including colonialism and empire building and, uh, and such. So we're not trying to achieve equality as local, national, regional partners. We're not trying to be equal to our international and global uh, partners. For us, equitable partnerships um, should achieve fairness uh, in our dealings, in our day-to-day -day dealings, in, our, in the way we approach specific projects, on how we design projects, um, a, f a fair um, uh, playing ground, at least uh, in those types of situations, is what we are um, going for. Um, so what are some of the elements uh, we look for in equitable partnerships? Um, for one, um, we have no shortage of recognition within the humanitarian system that local partners are usually the first on the ground to respond to emergencies, the last to stay after emergencies, and the first also in some post-crisis rehabilitation work. So everyone knows that, everyone talks about it. It's been reiterated today many times. What we look for is an equi equitable and uh, intentional investment in propping up the sustainable capacity um, of local partners to prepare, to anticipate, to coordinate, and to respond to crises, uh, sometimes even before they happen, uh, not just when crises happen. Um, our access to resources uh, is limited in most situations, or probably in all situations. We, have, um, we, we do not have the same access to resources as our uh, global partners. 
Um, and we're also often uh, isolated from decision-making circles. Um, so uh, we are, as a result, overburdened, uh, under-resourced, and um, uh, under-prepared to respond effectively to crises. So ideally, achieving equity and partnerships would mean uh, not just recognizing these limitations, uh, but as uh, uh, Matt Nims just said, it's, not, it's, it's time to go beyond recognition into some uh, you know, intentional investments to uh, prop up our capacity to actually prepare and respond to um, uh, disasters. Um, in situations where uh, our funding partners or donors are not able to directly fund uh, local actors, they usually tend to go through intermediaries. Uh, in these arrangements, um, intermediaries are interested uh, with the resources to create this uh, channel of accountability um, in order to minimize risks, as it's often said, um, and to ensure that um, an equitable share uh, of the resources reaches local and national actors. Uh, however, for all the goodwill that we see in the capital cities in, in, in conversations like this uh, from people at headquarters, what we often see, especially at the country level, uh, is just yet another channel uh, that creates an imbalance of power. Uh, we often see intermediaries assuming the role of the boss or, uh, you know, often uh, taking the role of, you know, I tell you what to do. We're, this, this money comes through us, so we set what you get, we set the goals, we set um, what the objectives of the project should be, we, we set the needs. Um, so there's that imbalance of power attitude uh, when we work with intermediaries. Um, and, and usually um, when they do that or when that happens, um, they often miss out also on the opportunity to actually adequately leverage our own capacities, our potential to fully respond to, di to disasters. So uh, this uh, imbalanced relationship, which often leads to a climate of mistrust amongst us, um, uh, is, uh, we, we feel like it's, it goes against the uh, idea of equitable or equity in our partnerships. Um, some of the, sorry, some of the challenges uh, that we experience in our partnerships include um, conditions uh, to accessing the resources that uh, we've heard this uh, throughout the day today and yesterday as well. Uh, there are some heavy bureaucratic uh, procedures, uh, administrative burdens um, that, I mean, even, even AHA, uh, even though we're called a Southern International NGO or regional NGO, uh, even these bureaucratic uh, procedures are very cumbersome for us. They, um, they not only uh, require extra staff time for the, for the staff that we have, uh, that sometimes they actually require additional staff positions uh, for which we don't have the resources. Um, some requirements, um, I, uh, uh, you know, I refer to, uh, you know, the... Our ECHO uh, colleague today mentioned, you know, the, the requirement to actually have a presence or be being registered within the EU to access ECHO funds directly. Uh, he mentioned that that's not going away anytime soon. Um, so that creates this modality to work with uh, our, you know, intermediaries, which, which is okay in some cases because since we don't have the capacity to actually fulfill uh, all of those ECHO requirements, working through intermediaries is okay, but if that intermediary relationship is not equitable, uh, that creates, again, another bottleneck uh, uh, for mutually beneficial um, partnership. Um, and sometimes we see this multiple links in the transaction, uh, in, the, in the transactional chain, uh, leading to accumulated overhead costs uh, from the donor to our intermediaries, to us, and ultimately to the uh, people in need. Um, so, that's uh, one, one challenge that we see uh, for equitable partnerships. And then there are also procedural delays in the final disbursements of resources, uh, which also delays the activity startup time. Um, what do we propose? Um, I, I mean, I, I don't think we need anything revolutionary in this sense. I think the humanitarian system, uh, as I said earlier, has been great, has been ahead of the curve, in identifying the problems within our system and in proposing 
some revolutionary solutions. You mentioned earlier the global humanitarian platform uh, from about 15 years ago where the principles of partnership have came out, these concepts of equality, um, transparency, result-oriented approach, complementarity, and all of that. And as we were making progress um, towards you know, inculcating these concepts into our daily work, somehow the global humanitarian platform disappears, and then we move on to the grand bargain and the world humanitarian system, and, and now the grand bargain 2.0. So we're ahead of the curve in terms of identifying what needs to be done. I think the revolutionary <laughs> action that we need is actually in implementing um, these ideas um, I, for, for all the good that has been done in identifying the problems, uh, implementing uh, those ideas has been, has been uh, dragging. Today we've heard some, I, some notions about moving the needle of change, uh, tweaking the levers of change. Um, I think at this point, we don't need to tweak the needles or move the needles, we just need to bulldoze the wall down. <laughs> we need to use a jackhammer to bring down the barriers and start implementing what's already in the books. Um, um, so this, this doesn't just happen because we say it, it takes a concerted effort. It takes a concerted effort by people uh, like Mr. Nims and people in his position uh, by making intentional decisions. Um, making the, you know, as the custodians of resources uh, and, and by the gatekeepers of uh, the policy making corridors, busting the door wide open to let um, the actual frontline responders access uh, what they need. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Ms. Kier. I think you gave us lots of interesting elements and very concrete in terms of way forwards. I very much liked your point about us not being the same. On the contrary, I think our diversity is a strength and we should use it this way, but it also means that we should have this acceptance and this respect towards each other for being different, but still needed to work together to the benefit of people affected by crisis. And I like that you put the pressure on Matt and his office. <laughs> Let's do the same a bit with UNICEF now. <laughs> Hazel, I have the same question for you. What are the values and the aims of UNICEF in its partnership with NGOs? And concretely, what steps are you undertaking to implement them? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, at the outset, let me say, I'm really pleased to um, be here in person. Um, I just arrived from Istanbul. I really wanted to be. It's my first engagement with ICFA. Um, I'm a newly uh, appointed deputy executive, deputy director for emergencies based here in, in Geneva, and I wanted to be here in person. So um, at the outset, it is a really important, and I really thank you, Mirela as well as Ignacio for having invited me and putting the pressure on me. I wasn't quite sure about that one. <laughs> but, <laughs> but let me give you a little bit of a very concrete information and as to why. It is not even a question as to why we have to work with partners. Um, UNICEF cannot deliver, be it our humanitarian requirements or our development requirements if we do not have collaborative and effective partners. So I've asked for a couple of what I call fun facts. Um, so I'm told that UNICEF works together with about 5,900 NGO partners. I believe in 2022, um, UNICEF channeled um, 2.9 billion to partners. And I'd like to keep to, to note here that it's both government and NGOs. Um, I think last year, 57% of this amount, um, a total of about 1.6 billion, was provided directly to NGOs. And I believe 62% or 1 billion went to local NGOs. Um, I'd also like to note that um, we gave more than the 35% cash to funding local NGOs and CSOs. So I think it's an important recognition in terms of the grant bargain. And then finally, I'd like to note that in the humanitarian track, 
um, in terms of our funding. 79% of our funding went to local CSOs last year. And that um, is compared to the 21% that we had um, in 2021. So clearly, this is not just about the funding, but I thought I wanted to give a little bit of exact information in terms of what is it that we are doing. Um, I also want to recognize our long-standing partnership with ICSVA, and because of that partnership, it allowed us, way back several years ago, we were able to undertake a level of evaluation and understanding and giving us a, a sense at the global setting on how UNICEF goes about its partnerships, um, particularly in the humanitarian settings. And um, allow me to start with the good ones, okay? Um, I, we will, we'll, for now, we'll, we'll just start with everything that goes okay. Apparently, the reason we all want to work together, and I think this is a no-brainer, it's because we have shared commitments. We are here because we want to look after the most affected children and their communities. So to me, that makes it's a no-brainer, it's a given. I think the next part that is equally important and relevant is the fact of joint analysis, I'm told, planning and implementing the response, including joint roles around advocacy and issues where we have. I think what is critically important that also brings value added is the fact that we are present in the field, not just at the global level, not at the regional, but also at the country level and at the subnational. So 80% 80 of our staff in about 150 or so countries, I don't know the exact number, clearly. And then there is also this presentation that there is strong technical expertise so we can learn and work with each other on various issues. Clearly our uh, interest around nutrition, child protection, wash, etc. Um, gives us that basis to work on very concrete um, aspects in terms of what is it that we can do. And then I'd also like to note is the issue about how do we go about managing our respective partnerships. And I think the UN portal is a particularly important aspect. We do that together with UNHCR, WFP, and UN, UNFPA. Clearly, it helps us um, to improve partnerships, um, information clearer, as well as processes a little bit more transparent. Now, I'm sure you would like to know what else? What else? Is it? I would want to be fairly honest. I have joined UNICEF after 15 years. Um, I was part dabbling in peacekeeping. UNICEF is not an easy organization, even for me, who's been part of it. So I'm going to be very honest with all of you. It's a complex, it's large, and it's not easy to navigate. So uh, our program PCA agreements, our legal framework that governs our relationship, it's challenging. So I recognize that. Um, the interpretation, given the fact that we're a particularly strong decentralized organization. So when you speak to me at the global level, you may get one view. When you go to the regional level, you may get, may get another view on the same issue. And let alone if you go to the country level, that may be even different. So we do recognize when you have large organizations, despite the fact that we want to be structured, organized and clear, and that our PCA is that framework, I fully recognize it's not always easy. And then I think also clearly, um, my colleague here clearly mentioned it when he talked about intermediaries. You work for us. <laughs> or we don't work with you. Um, I, I fully understand that at times, um, I'm very proud to be a UNICEF, and I'm grateful and wonderful, and we all know the fantastic brand we have. Um, but I will be very honest equally. Once you have such a strong brand, it's not always easy to talk about partnerships and the equality of partnerships. Um, not the same but the fact that we are equals when you have such a strong brand. And so we're quite conscious about this. We've had this internal discussions. As I said, I came from Istanbul. We had a global management leadership course there and discussions, um, and we recognize that. But it is not easy to move this particular needle. I strongly recommend no bulldozing here. 
we will get to it and we'll find a way on how we can um, increase an environment where it is an equal partnership. And I want to register this, the, the wording. One word we changed, implementing partners. From now on, our PCAs will say partners. And to me, that's an important cultural shift. It shows that we recognize and understand the need that even this organization that's 75 years old can also change. And so I just wanted to leave that. And then finally, I want to reiterate the complexity of our structures and the fact that we are decentralized. And it's something that we recognize, but I'm sure that given the collective needs in the interest of children and their communities, we will be able to work through that. I think, um, and in how do we work through that? That was a very concrete. I think, let me start off by the systemic. We, as part of our partnership and membership in the Interagency Standing Committee, clearly, I'm not a big fan of this word intermediary, I have to say. I would prefer a different one. Um, UNICEF and Oxfam, we co-chair the local and national um, work streams. Um, and I really want to say that we've been able to look at the overhead costs. That's very concrete and very specific. Um, I believe we were able to complete it, finalize it, and it's slightly a challenging thing because you have to go through your legal documentation. I'm, I'm sure our colleague and BH will agree between the lawyers, our funding procedures, <laughs> It's not always easy to want to be an equal partner as we would want to because there are processes and requirements. But we have been able to look honestly to see how best we can improve. And it's, it's, um, I think it's the work in progress. I am feeling confident that we'll find a way about how we can go about that. And I think what is very clear um, in terms of all of this is that we've been able to strengthen the whole relationship around the principles. Um, and that is going to be very, very concrete, very clear, so that in the context of our humanitarian aid will, we will make sure that the principles are adequately reflected. And so, our partnership, we will issue it sometime in 2023, so you'll be able to see in a, the consolidation of our agreements and the idea to try and streamline. I have mentioned the fact that it's not easy, so we are looking at the notion of a one-stop shop, um, making it easier to access, simplifying some of our emergency procedures, and um, the whole issue around um, Facilitating localization, for example, the application of a 7% overhead cost for local partners. It's going to be there, as well as the possibility of looking at multi-year funding streams. But let me be honest, um, our ask for UNICEF was is 11 billion. We are seeing less and less um, flexible and unearmarked funding, and that makes the relationship equally. It has a knock-on effect. So I just wanted to put that out there. There is a keen interest, but um, the needs are large, the funding pot is small. And then finally, I would want to say, um, I think there is need for us. The whole idea is that we will um, better communicate to all of you. It's a commitment that I'm making in terms of our partnership procedure, so that's full understanding about how to go about that. I'd also want to say that we have heard some of the concerns raised on the PSEA clause in the revised PCA. We are looking at it, we are dealing with our legal officers, and we should be able to find time and resolve it. So I just wanted to say, I think I also want to note our ongoing collaboration with IGVA, our upcoming annual NGO forum that will happen later this year. Um, our two virtual sessions that's underway and I think that is really important and then finally I agree we will definitely renew our commitments towards uh, the principle of partnerships and let me say them again because I think it's important to renew the, to state them all the time so that we're all pretty clear equality transparency results oriented approach responsibility and complementarity and with that I hope I didn't go over my time. Thank you.
Thank you so much. And I have to confess that I worked for a couple of years with UNITA. I'm very proud of that. But I did find the organization not complex. I found it complicated. <laughs> But it is also true that we are proud of the collaboration that we have with IMOBS. We have done a lot together in terms of strengthening the partnership of UNICEF with NGOs. We did the assessment that you mentioned. We will redo it this year to have some, also some comparison between the results at that time and the results now. And then, as you mentioned, it's a big organization, so we might have a great collaboration with IMOPS, we might have a less good collaboration with other offices. So we also hope that this collaboration with IMOPS will help us to build a good relationship with the other structures of the organization. So it's an ongoing process, and we do notice a lot of improvements and also a few issues that we'll keep uh, pushing for for improving that. So thank you very much, Hazel. And now I give the floor to, to Sarah, who is uh, my counterpart at Interaction. And ICVA works very closely with Interaction, as we do with uh, SCHR, with Voice, with uh, A4EP that is here today with us, as we do it also with NIR and many other networks. And that's also because very often we hear from our NGO members the same complaints, actually, in terms of partnership, the same challenges, the same asks. So, Sarah, what are some of the asks that you hear from the NGO members at Interactions? And how do you find, in terms of advocating, what is the space and the success, the potential that you see in there advocating for these asks? I am so thankful that Morella saved the easy questions for me as the <laughs> last speaker on the last panel of the last day of the week. Um, so this will be this will be really easy, um, <laughs> and it's also very hard at this point in in the week to say much that is new. So I'll try to not repeat everything that my colleagues have already said. Um, but hopefully to offer some, some new framings and some new thoughts. Um, you know, I think the last few years from the COVID pandemic to the Ukraine response to um, an unthinkable number of droughts in the Horn of Africa, I think we have learned a lot about partnerships. I think we all really know actually what good partnerships look like. We know them when we see them, when we have good working relationships, when there is clear communication between partners, when there is um, a, an easy way, or maybe not easy, but at least a clear way to resolve implementation challenges. But on the flip side, I think we all know what it looks like when partnerships go wrong. And I think probably everybody in here has some examples in their back pocket of exactly what that looks like, how that feels, and the effect that that has on the work that we're trying to do and on the communities that we're trying to help. So as, as Ms. Kier was saying, like, we're ahead of the curve. We know what to do. Now we need to do it. How do we do those things? What does that actually look like? Um, in short, I think it looks like a whole bunch of things that are quite easy to say and quite difficult to do. Uh, but what we hear from our partners is that we need to improve trust between actors in the system. Some of that lack of trust is due to fiduciary responsibility of donors or of intermediaries. Donors have a responsibility to ensure that government funds are well spent, and that is a serious responsibility. Some of that lack of trust is due to risk. 
we often think about it quite differently. Each one of us are, are very focused on our own idea of what the risks are and how we manage those. And that quite often leads to our taking a very siloed approach. But let's be real here. Some of that lack of trust in our sector is because of paternalism, racism, and sexism. And we, and here I'm speaking as someone from the Global North, don't always trust our local or national NGO counterparts because of the conscious and unconscious biases that we are carrying around with us. And we have a responsibility to educate ourselves, to figure out where we are applying those harmful lenses and those biases and to change them. At this point, maybe you're thinking, oh great, Sarah, thanks. So the answer is to root out structural racism, easy, let's, let's get right on that. Um, and I know that that's, I know that that's hard and I know that that's gonna take a really long time, far longer than it should or than any of us want it to. So what do we do now? And, and where are some of those solutions that we're hearing from partners? I think the biggest one is to engage. We need to engage transparently and regularly. We need to do so acknowledging that we are, I hate to use the word equals, but that we are, we are equals, we're all in this together and that we need to do that engagement, continually looking for opportunities to do more or better. Specifically, that looks like giving partners advance notice of policy changes and setting aside time to receive and incorporate that feedback. It looks like providing additional transparency on funding and budgetary decisions and providing clear universal guidance on indirect and staffing cost coverage to give just two examples. Looks like increasing the possibility for multi-year funding, which helps reduce administrative burdens, particularly for local NGOs and enables them to conduct long-term planning. And it looks like taking the initiative to reach out to partners, even when we don't have to, because we're in a position of relative power. Um, Hazel and Morella noted some of the great work that ICFA and UNICEF have done in this regard, and I'm, I'm really happy to, to positively point out the UNHCR partnership survey that Interaction conducts with UNHCR each year. And also WFP last year conducted a FLA partner survey. Those surveys, they seem mundane and they seem like, probably they seem like a waste of time sometimes, but they also give us a really useful evidence base to know which changes we need to make and what we need to prioritize. Because we engage with each other as equals, we need to do so to give each other flexibility. And I would suspect that every person in this room has worked at some point on a crisis that has changed. New needs have emerged, perhaps in new locations. And so we know that we need to be flexible enough to meet those changes, that our funding needs to flex, that our locations need to flex, and that our programming needs to flex. And again, we're seeing, we're seeing some really encouraging uh, signs in this space. And as we've heard today, some institutional donors, some UN agencies, some INGOs are increasing their financial flexibility. Let's see more of that. And finally, I'll say that we really need to continue engaging with everyone, with all stakeholders in the humanitarian space at various levels. Multi-stakeholder collaboration is critical to understanding the root causes of challenges and to developing practical solutions to best support the communities that we work with. This is especially true when it comes to the inclusion and involvement of our local NGO and CSO counterparts. 
entities and policy processes like the IASC or the Grand Bargain are not perfect, but they do facilitate that type of engagement, bringing together all of the stakeholders in the system. But those platforms, in my opinion, are not being utilized to their fullest extent. Commitment to these dialogues, to the initiatives, varies widely among stakeholders. That won't do. We need everyone to actively participate in order to make the substantive adjustments required to meet rising need around the world. I want to particularly emphasize this point because, as we heard on the earlier session, Grand Bargain 2.0 is coming to an end. And I'm concerned that our collective commitment to the Grand Bargain commitments is waning. We urge all signatories to recommit to the Grand Bargain platform and to those commitments that they signed up to however long ago it was. We are all in this together. Humanitarian needs are not decreasing. We are all part of an ecosystem full of inherent risks and we each take on a share of those risks. We could have a whole other conversation about risk sharing at some point, but my actual point here is that none of us could do what we do without each other. And I think we need to remember that in all of our conversations and particularly in our partnerships. Thank you so much, Sarah. And you made some very concrete suggestions about the renewed commitment to the grand bargain, but also very specific about what NGOs expect in terms of changes of policy and knowing them in advance and few more. Uh, so I hope that all the UN agencies and state donors in the room took good notes of all the suggestions. If not, this session is recorded together with the whole annual conference of IGVA. We'll share that with you and we'll make sure we follow up on this discussion. So thank you, Sarah. I am afraid we don't have much time, so without uh, losing further time, I will open the floor for questions. And I see already a few questions here in the room. Uh, if you could give the microphone to Jamil, then the gentleman from uh, Jordan. We have one colleague from uh, Sudan. And then uh, we'll take four more questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for the panel on talking about the equitable partnership. Uh, the, uh, the equitable partnership uh, means to us that treat the international NGOs and the national NGOs are the same. But still, uh, there is uh, still not equitable in the overhead percentage. Uh, some uh, some organization or some even UN agency, they haven't uh, they give uh, the overhead uh, percentage to international NGOs, but not to the national NGOs, while the national NGOs are the most needs for that. Uh, I am really happy that uh, UNICEF starting looking at changing their policy and starting to look at uh, giving the 7% of overhead to the national NGOs, but uh, also it will be the same uh, treat with uh, inter international NGOs. Uh, on the other hand, I'm just uh, giving my question to Matthew. Uh, what measures uh, that USAID will take to make sure that their uh, uh, like intermediate uh, donor that give the local NGOs part of uh, the overhead uh, that USAID give to them? Uh, also, I am uh, so happy that in the morning that uh, Oxfam mentioned that they will give 50% of their overhead to the local partners uh, or local implementing partners, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, it will be helpful for uh, local NGOs. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much for the panelists for their excellent presentations. I think uh, I agree that we should be optimistic. We should use terms, uh, positive terms like 
harmonization of the conditions or partnership. These are very good terms. But let us be practical a little bit. I think the mission to harmonize the conditions of donors is a close to impossible mission because each donor has its own policy, its own agenda. Even the donors are also controlled by the parliaments or the governments, for example, in each country, for example, in Canada, they say we have fund for human security agenda, for example, uh, USAID for gender, whatever. The question is how to simplify the conditions of the donors, how, for example, to allow for some administrative cost to be known that NGOs, they have personnel, they have uh, some cost. Also, how donors help NGOs to write a proposal. Sometimes, I know from experience in Jordan, some NGOs, they don't have the qualifications to write a proposal. How donors really can help in these areas. And the issue of the other side, uh, among the recipients, to be partners, it's a good uh, objective. But they have competition among them, themselves. There are thousands of them. Like uh, in Jordan, we have over 6,000. Uh, in Yemen, I heard like over 15,000 or something. Uh, those, uh, there they should be really a way to like list those who are actually active, who, who deliver works. Uh, and there must be like, uh, I don't like to say a blacklist, but at least the uh, donors should know who is active, who uh, use uh, the funds in a very transparent way. And also the recipients should be transparent to the point that they convince donors to simplify their conditions for funding. Thank you. Thank you very much. I take Sudan, and I think we'll close here this round of, uh, of questions to give a chance to our panelists to answer. Please. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Ibrahim Modi. I'm from Sudan. I'm the chairman for the National NGO Forum. Uh, actually, my pleasure to be here, and thank you so much, Igra, uh, for this, and thank you so much, panelists. Um, I just have some few very direct questions. Um, especially um, a colleague from UNICEF and also Sara from Interactions and also a colleague from uh, AHA. Um, actually, um, uh, it has been a lot of talks about the funding and uh, UNICEF has done a great uh, job on that, especially in my country, a lot of NGOs are actually getting funds from UNICEF even though it's not like everyone is coming. As we just said, the due diligence process is very hard. But now, um, coming to the engagement, which also Sarah stated, that how we can engage the national NGO, um, especially on the leadership. And I know UNICEF is a um, lead agency for many, uh, for several clusters in the country, but it's still the way we see it, like UNICEF is on the top of that, and, and no, uh, you know, like the engagement of, of, of the national NGO. Uh, this is very weak. So we need to also focus when we talk, you know, uh, about the money uh, versus also the engagement and the coordination. Um, so, uh, and, and my second question is for a BHA, Mr. Mr. Neem. Uh, I see B, uh, BHA USA uh, especially have done a great job when it comes to the funding that uh, passed through the national NGO and also there's um, a commitment from USA that 25% should be allocated, and there was a policy out. So my direct question is, what is the next step? That how this will be realized to ensure that we have this, uh, let's say 25% is, is achieved. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I know there are many more questions in the room. Let's try to give a floor to the panelists to answer this once, and then we see if we have time to, to get more questions. I have uh, seven questions right now, noted down. A uh, few of them go to Matt. So, Nat, if I can uh, just repeat them for you. There was a question about uh, how to simplify the conditions and pr procedures. This is a question that is coming out throughout the, the discussion, actually, and we had strong points about this from local NGOs. 
who find the current procedures overcomplicated and it takes too much time, resources, and uh, efforts from them to, to comply with them. On the other hand, we also understand, especially in your case, being the biggest humanitarian donor, that you have a strong compliance system. So how do you balance between localization uh, priority and compliance priorities? Then one question about the next step. I think this is linked, like concretely, what are the next steps that you are undertaking in terms of ensuring that the money goes to the local and national NGOs? Um, there was a question about uh, the role of uh, the BAJ in uh, engaging with uh, international NGOs so that they can recognize the overhead cost to their national partners. These are the main questions that I uh, noted down for, for you. Please, you have the floor. Thanks, Thanks for that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. Those are great, those are great questions. Um, so on the first one, on we'll call it compliance, uh, I think the, the level of frustration on the local NGO, on all NGOs, on, on the UN, on everybody, on, on what it takes to get awards and, and that. You can also add in our own teams, both in the field and in Washington, on, on kind of where we are on this. I, I, I think, Sarah, you made some great points initially about uh, you know what it the, the the stress and pressures that 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 uh, donor organizations or at least the groups within governments that have under them to be able to continue to do that. I I think that that's all true, and I and I think that uh, there is a special complexity for maybe the local NGO as it as it or the local organization as it kind of breaks into those those types of of, of funding arrangements. Um, but but it does exist, and so on. On the BHA side, we have taken on, as we go through the you know the the next six eight months, some ways of looking at this differently, and it's it's trying to look at all of the whole toolbox available to us: multi award versus fast acting award versus local versus this, and and to try to have a more defined process that allows us both internally to work with partners, but also to, to make sense with not the same approach for every situation that, that we deal with. This is going to take a while. This, we're embarking on this now, but this, we call it an award process review is one way to, is what, what we're calling it. Um, we'll take many months and, and actually will be something that we continue to, to hone for the next two or three years. So. I, I guess what I wanted to say was like, there's no one answer to this, but that I think it's not, it's actually shared by our internal teams and our field teams as well that, that liaise with, with the groups on the ground in general. And um, the gentleman, I think from, from Jordan talking about harmonization between all donors. Now that's, that's phenomenal. And that, that, that would be, you know the, the the promised you know kind kind of land in many ways on, on what we do, and I'm not going to make any grand proclamations on that. Uh, I think certain things uh, through the grand bargain and other ways you know have pushed us along, but no doubt there there is a way to go. That being said, I think people have been saying you know USAID is one of the large yes donors um, does bear a responsibility to 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 make our processes better to be able to move the, the, this more quickly. And, and that kind of leads me to, to the next question about, um, again, specifically on the localization side, like, you know, how, how do we do that? And, and again, uh, just speaking in broad categories, there's sort of two ways. There's that, there's the, 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 the level of, of overhead that goes, you know, to a sub partner, to a sub grantee, to, and I, I love what, what, what you said about partnership as opposed to, to implementing partners, but just partners. So the, the, those sub-partner awards um, that are part that, that we would give to, to the large INGOs or the UN. And we are very much open to talking with all parties involved to ensure when we when those when that is the mechanism that there is more of an understood, agreed upon and known type of, of, of pass through directly to that local group, that local team, that local expertise. In addition, 
when AID, as we embark on this localization, and I say as we embark because I, I don't, there are talks about that 25% um, uh, I, I goal for the agency writ large. Um, we are like that. That is really the ultimate goal: is is direct awards or you know direct partnership with local entities, and and with the the requisite overhead funding that that is there. And we are starting this. We BHA. I, I think that the agency is is being very aggressive and changing and trying to build the support needed to do that. And that means allowing for you know. Um, our grant guidelines writ large to be in multiple languages, uh, just as there are certain qualifications or, or, or um, you know, rules about how one entity accepts US government funds, how do we make that more open to partners who live outside of the US? And, and we've moved along pretty well in that. And we are starting to get direct implementing relationships in the field where we have, especially where we have large field presence to be able to to get those 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 type of relationships going, but I think that as we move forward, it, it's both. It's it's with our large awards, larger type awards, with let's just say existing partners, whether it be UN or NGO. I think being able to to say that there needs to be a higher level of focus on capacity building and how that translates into to differing agreements on on that pass through for, for that overhead is definitely something that, that we are open to talking about. And you combine that with, again, like direct local funding that has its requisite uh, overhead, that is definitely the, the, the way to go. And I think, you know, just, I think the last point on this, not because I know time is short, there really is, I think, most definitely in the agency writ large, but I think more so than I've ever seen it in my experience. A sea change with on the humanitarian side is that idea, not just because it's the right thing to do on, on the levels we talked about equity uh, and, e e and, and being equal, but it's actually the smart thing to do. <laughs> and, and that doesn't sound exactly the way I want it to sound here, but there there is a, a culture shift going on, I think, within the donors that this is the future and and as you know i i think as as the rep from unicef was saying we are in in as donors and i can definitely speak from the usaid side more than ever actually putting the the resources and the plans in place to actually make this happen on that localization side because it is the smart it is the future it will take time because it, it changes the mindset of, of what our systems are geared towards. And I think no other time in my past have I seen actual moving towards making that happen. And I know that's just one person's sort of observation, maybe who's been doing this for a while. But um, I, I do think the future is going to be opening up much more for this, for events like this, with our engagement with ICFA and others to try to figure those out as a word. And, and kudos to some of the big NGOs as well as WFP and, and UNICEF and other partners about having those field level agreements that are more reflective of where we need to go. And that's going to be another vehicle to be able to do that as well. So I don't think I answered all of those questions exactly right. Um, but I think that, that I'll leave it at that and we'll, to, to see time for other, other panelists. Over. Thank you very much, Matt. And uh, I think you mentioned the, the culture shift, that it's very important in terms of a donor's mindset. And of course, we recognize that this takes time. And as Misikir mentioned, we are not looking for a revolution, but we are looking for a progressive change, for sure. So thank you very much, and we'll be glad to follow up on this discussion and to create other opportunities for BJ to engage directly with our national and local members. Now, a few questions for UNICEF as well. The question about not looking only at the money, but looking also at the partnership and uh, national and uh, general more uh, NGO, particip uh, NGO leadership of clusters. What is the view of UNICEF on that? How UNICEF can support 
than your partners to overcome the capacity gaps whenever they exist. This was also mentioned by Miss Ikea, that not only saying you, you are not eligible to be a partner because of your assessment results, but also how do, you, do we help you to become finally a partner? And then the, the question about UNICEF may be advocating to the other UN agencies so that they also recognize the overhead cost to national and local NGOs. And some of them actually do, like UNHCR does that as well, but there are still some that don't. So do you see a role for UNICEF in that? Thank you. Um, I'll start with the last question. I, uh, yes. Uh, clearly, I can see that we that's something that we can undertake, and I think um, probably the best forum from the humanitarian side would be the ISC, and there's already a recognition uh, amongst that. I think what we have to recognize, it's not that they, they don't want to do it, it's a process. Uh, most of these things requires our budget processes as well as our legal processes. Um, we also have the um, reporting obligations to the donors, and so it's all part of a process, but given the fact that we're all in this together, I think it's quite feasible um, that this will become, and that there is, I agree uh, with Matt, that there is a culture shift when it comes to the way that we're approaching it slow. I agree with you, but we're all in this together, and um, we have to do it because our needs are more, and if we don't collectively do it, I don't think we'll be able to deliver. So I think there's a big recognition, and to the colleague who asked the question about engagement, cluster leaderships, and it's an absolute. Yes, we, where feasible, where practicable, we do it. And as UNICEF, it has been happening, maybe not in all of the countries consistently, but it is there. It is a recognition. Um, that when we can, we will do it. There is, there is, I don't think there is any procedure or, or, or a no against it. It's something that we understand, and it's something that we would want to do. Some countries it works better, and others it doesn't work as, as well. But we internally review and assess ourselves, um, and we see how best we can do it. So I would like to say um, both on those and... The aspect around capacity and advocacy, clearly, once again, I don't think we have any problems with that. It's just, like I said, it's a very large decentralized organization. So in one country, it may be working pretty well. In another country, for many different reasons, it won't be working as well. But there is no institutional no to it. I think that is what I would like to leave um, as an um, understanding for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we are running out of time, so I would briefly ask Ms. Ikir and Sarah for a last remark. Ms. Ikir. Um, thank you. I will be very brief. Uh, yes, we are all in this uh, together, but uh, we are not all equal as organizations. Um, let's, let's admit that notion. Uh, we are all created equal as human beings, but we're not created equal as organizations. And as your local, national, regional partners uh, for international uh, colleagues, we're not seeking equality with you. We're not trying to be the next Oxfam or CARE or UNICEF. You guys do that very well, um, and you guys and ladies do that very well. <laughs> um, what we want is equity. What we want to do is respond to the needs of our people. We want to be there first. We want to respond adequately, timely, efficiently. You have the resources. Be equitable, fair in the way you allocate it to your local and national partners. I'll conclude. I'll keep it even shorter and just say that I think, especially as we're sitting in Geneva in the humanitarian hub of the world, it would behoove us all to remember that the global only matters because the local existed first. And I think that we need to put that front and center when we are considering partnerships and when we're considering implementation and when we're considering the entire humanitarian structure.
Thank you very much. And from my side, I think partnership is like in life. I mean, it's about constructing things together, implementing them together, sharing responsibilities when things go wrong, but also sharing merits when uh, things go well. And we all know how it should work, so let's just make it now.